proximal humerus fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. These slides are by Dr. Kevin Perry, and I'm Saki Brahman narrating. So the objectives are going to be to review the principles of diagnosis and management of proximal humerus fracture, classification schemes, decision-making, treatment options, outcomes and evidence, and available resources for further education. So in this video, we're going to break this slide deck up into two videos. We're going to cover uh, anatomy, we're going to cover deforming forces, assessment, uh, indications, a little bit about non-operative management, and then in the next video we'll get into the operative management. So proximal humerus fracture is a fracture occurring at or proximal to the surgical neck. The uh, epidemiology is more often uh, seen in females with a bimodal distribution, distribution like a lot of fractures uh, in younger trauma patients and then in older females. The incidence does increase with age. Um, and this is one of these um, osteoporotic fractures that frequently can be utilized as a um, marker, kind of like a first diagnosis. I mean, you see a patient who has a fall in a uh, older patient with a proximal humerus fracture, and you may recognize this patient has osteoporosis that they didn't otherwise know. Uh, this is an opportunity to assess, potentially intervene, um, and hopefully prevent uh, something more disabling like a, like a proximal femur fracture. Other risk factors are poor vision, hearing aids, you know, risks for falls, essentially diabetes, alcohol consumption, um, protective factors include hormonal therapy, calcium intake, and patients who are otherwise um, being uh, actively managed for osteoporosis. Most of these occur as a ground-level fall, although you will also see these in um, trauma patients, so typically in younger patients. Uh, there are three main loading modes, uh, compressive as the humeral head hits the glenoid, angular forces at the surgical neck, um, causing bending failure, and then tension uh, with the rotator cuff pulling on the greater and lesser tuberosities. Um, often this is an indirect injury where you can kind of fall on your outstretched hand and land on the shoulder uh, or a combination of both. Um, and this can cause uh, either indirect or direct trauma to the shoulder. The majority are isolated low in energy injuries, although uh, you do have to look for associated injuries, either whether it's low energy or high energy. Uh, you can have a distal radius fracture, hip fracture, pelvic fracture. Uh, in um, many patients, you also have to make sure you don't have other injuries, head injury, nerve palsy. And some fracture patterns are at risk for axillary vessel injury. Uh, on clinical presentation, you're going to have shoulder pain. Uh, immobility, ecchymosis, swelling. Uh, open fractures are rare, uh, but they usually occur at the lateral aspect of the axilla as the pec major displaces the shaft medially. So, so let's look at that anatomy. Um, there are multiple uh, parts to keep in mind. There is the uh, humeral head, the greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity, and the shaft. So that's kind of like an exploded view shown here with each of those major fragments. And uh, here's the bony anatomy viewed from uh, multiple perspectives uh, that you should feel comfortable with. And this, to some extent, will also uh, mirror some of the imaging you'll see with um, the uh, image on the top left being kind of your grashy view or true AP view, uh, the image on the right being your uh, like scapular Y view, uh, and the image on the bottom being more of an axillary view. So the deforming forces include the uh, rotator cuff, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus on the greater tuberosity. And as you can see in the, uh, the arrow over here, uh, that is a, de a deforming force that will tend to cause the fragment to go superiorly and posteriorly. Subscapularis is going to potentially displace the lesser tuberosity medially, as you would expect. Pectoralis major will cause the shaft to displace medially and anteriorly, so you'll often see 
So one of this like apex anterior angulation at the surgical neck, as well as uh, significant displacement of that shaft medially. And the deltoid can displace the uh, humeral shaft proximally. So I made brief mention to the imaging uh, and a standard trauma series would be something like a Grashy view, which is a true AP, uh, a scapular Y view, uh, again, shown in the previous anatomic drawings, uh, and then the axillary lateral view. And we'll go through these. Additional views can be obtained as well. And um, because of the anatomy, because of the uh, sometimes difficulty fully assessing the fractures, uh, given the you know sort of spherical nature of the humeral head and the difficulty sometimes di uh, understanding displacement of the fragments, CT scan can be really helpful. Um, sometimes MRI or ultrasound can be used as well. So here is the axillary review. Now you can imagine in a uh, injured patient. It's going to be very difficult to obtain a good axillary review. Uh, an alternative is the Velpo view, which is another way to attempt to get an axillary view. And you can see the patient in this case still has the uh, arm, uh, you can imagine, in a sling, for example, and not needing to um, abduct away from the body. Here's an example of those standard trauma series views, you have the Grashy view or true AP. Now keep in mind, the Grashy view, if we go back a couple of slides, is not shot perpendicular to the body, right? It's shot, it's shot in parallel with the face of the glenoid, right? So you either have to turn the patient or um, adjust the position of the cassette relative to the patient when, the, when that view is shot, as opposed to just a, essentially like a regular AP, which is kind of an AP perpendicular to the chest wall. And you will not really see uh, that uh, joint space as shown here. There'll be an overlap on the regular uh, shoulder AP. Um, and there's your Y view you, where you want to see uh, if this is the glenoid here. You want to see the humeral head relatively centered on the glenoid. And then your axillary view, you know, in the axillary view, you're looking again at the glenoid here, you can see the coracoid, and you want to make sure that humeral head is articulating with the glenoid, as well as this is just an orthogonal view to see um, some of the other anatomy, such as the acromion, the coracoid. Classification um, is uh, frequently by near classification, which is a very old classification, and uh, as you can see from the original paper here, um, div divided into these parts where you have the humeral head, the greater tuberosity, the lesser tuberosity, the shaft. And I think that these are fairly consistent fragments that are seen in many fracture patterns. So it is really understand to understand uh, important to understand um, what the parts are. The, the problem with the near classification is that there's this quirk that to be a part, the fracture has to be displaced greater than a centimeter or angulated 45 degrees. Now, if you've tried to interpret shoulder x-rays, I mean, you literally have this spherical globe and now you're supposed to determine how much angulation there is of a fracture fragment, like a tuberosity, or how displaced it is based on plane films where everything's overlapped. So, um, the inner observer reliability with this is terrible, um, and it's truly very difficult to, if you're using that criteria uh, to make decisions um, based just on plane films, which usually are not even in great plane films to begin with. But even with the best films, it can be very difficult to assess true displacement um, because of the nature of the anatomy you're looking at, and certainly angulation. Um, with a greater tuberosity, um, sometimes we'll consider a part to be five millimeters of displacement, so there's a little bit of controversy there. AOOTA, uh, comprehensive classification, the proximal humerus is bone 11. I mean, it's the humerus is bone number one. The proximal humerus is the second number is one, right? So it's 11. Uh, and then... Um, the A, Bs, and C types are uh, kind of shown here. I'm not going to go through them uh, in detail, but it's sort of 
extraarticular, unifocal, bifocal, or an articular fracture. So this um, sort of follows fracture patterns we see. I mean, the one thing I'll say about neuroclassification, it certainly does recognize the major fracture lines that we typically see and allows you to sort of understand um, common fracture patterns. So we talked a little bit about the greater tuberosity. So indications for greater tuberosity, fragment, in, uh, like surgical indications, meaning like if you how much displacement do you have before you need to go in and fix it? It's evolved. Um, and um, you know, here are some criteria listed here um, that uh, you know sometimes we may not tolerate as much displacement as we thought we would uh, because it certainly can cause impingement, especially in overhead activities. Let's shift gears, talk a little bit about blood supply to the humeral head. So uh, we worry to some extent about osteonecrosis. Um, you know, in the femoral head, it can be extremely disabling when you get osteonecrosis. In the shoulder, it can be a problem, uh, perhaps not as clinically disabling, uh, but um, you, know, you have terminal vessels here. So the arcuate artery is a terminal blood supply to the humeral head. We'll show this in some images and can be disrupted with anatomic neck fractures in particular. Um, posterior humeral uh, circumflex uh, supplies the posterior medial metaphysis of the humerus, um, and we'll show that in the, in the image as well. And um, there are some sort of classic predictors of humeral head osteonecrosis, or ABN, hurdles criteria, as demonstrated here. Give you a second to look at that. Here's our... Um, anatomy of the uh, blood supply I was talking about. So you have the anterior humeral circumflex, uh, which gives rise to the arcuate artery. You have the posterior uh, humeral circumflex um, coming posteriorly as well, and these are branches off of the axillary artery. Hurdle's criteria has been recently called into question. The original study used intraoperative Doppler flow uh, metry as well as uh, visual bleeding from drill holes in the humeral head to, to, uh, to determine vascular supply. And uh, if you didn't see bleeding, they said, well, it's associated with osteonecrosis. And that's been challenged. Maybe hurdles criteria are not quite as predictive as osteonecrosis. Uh, poor reductions can be predictive, perhaps. How do you treat these? Well, the majority are treated non-surgically. Um... And if you treat them surgically, there are numerous techniques, as shown here. Uh, suture fixation, oftentimes uh, tension band methods, arthroscopic assisted repair, closed reduction pinning, uh, open reduction internal fixation with plate and screw devices, as well as intramedullary nails, and sometimes arthroplasty plays a role as well. Indications for non-op management are generally... Demographically, older age, lower demands, patients medically unfit for surgery, uh, and then as far as fractures are concerned, stable, non-displaced, minimally displaced fractures or valgus impacted fractures, except for the valgus impacted four parts. Um, and these can be treated with a sling, swing, sling with abduction pillow, and then early active assisted range of motion, uh, pendulum exercises uh, to prevent stiffness. You should be familiar with this trial. We're not going to show a ton of papers in this slide deck, but this is one that has uh, generated a lot of uh, discussion. Large randomized control trial out of the UK, 1,250 patients. 250 patients met surgical indications and then were randomized to operative versus non-op management. And these were all comers, um, you know, age-wise, for example. Um, no difference in outcomes. At two years follow up, um, and um, you know, maybe there's some controversy regarding you know the groups and treatment conversion. I mean, 87 had an indication for surgery, but were not included. Uh, some were randomized and did not receive surgery. Uh, again, it's a large multicenter randomized trial, so you can uh, poke all kind of holes at it. Uh, lots of surgeons involved, but. Um, not a lot of difference. So, I mean, this certainly has supported non-operative management in many patients. And I encourage you to take a look at that trial. So, Tom kind of mentioned there's some operative options as well. We're going to pause here and then we'll pick up with 
uh, operative uh, techniques, indications, and some case examples in the next and final video in this slide deck. Thank you.